Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, installment in our webinar series for CNBC and CNBCScott.com. I'm Tyler Matheson. Welcome, everyone. There probably has been no more eagerly awaited initial public offering than the one on Facebook. It's due to launch sometime later this month, maybe a couple of weeks from today, maybe not. Who knows? Whatever, the company is about to begin its uh, sort of uh, climactic road show next week, at which time its executives will tour around and present the case for the company uh, to brokers and investors. Let's begin today uh, by asking you a question uh, and get your responses immediately, right off the top here. Given all of the excitement over Facebook's initial public offer, would you buy Facebook shares at the offering price if you could? So go ahead and respond right now, and we'll take a look at what you're saying. And as you can see right on the screen there, uh, 8 out of 10, more than 8 out of 10 of you say, yes, you would buy that company's shares at the offering price. 12% are not so sure. 7% say, no, they would not. We'll be back with further questions uh, at the end of our webinar today. Of course, Facebook is uh, one of the most exciting uh, companies in all of the Internet space, with some 900 million users worldwide, including presumably most of you who are online with us today. To take you inside Facebook's money machine, it's my pleasure to, oh yes, let me uh, just uh, backtrack here uh, and uh, let you know that after the session uh, from our presenter today, uh, we will take your questions. And there are two ways uh, you can do that. You can raise your virtual hand and submit the question uh, digitally to us, or we'll call on you to ask your question via audio. Those questions we will again take at the end of the presentation today. Now, to our presenter today, to take you inside Facebook's money machine, is CNBC's social media correspondent, among many other things, Julia Borston. Julia? Thanks so much, Tyler. Uh, such a treat to, to talk about this company that I've been following for so long and so exciting as it gets ready to go public in just a couple of weeks now. So the, the numbers inside Facebook are fascinating, and it's never been so much fun to, re to read a company's uh, SEC filings. I want to just highlight here how huge Facebook really is. As of the end of the first quarter of 2012, so as of the end of March, Facebook had 901 million active users every single month, and that's up by 33% from a year ago. The daily active users are 526 million. That's just an amazing number if you think about it. Half a billion people around the world use Facebook every single day, and that number is up 41% from a year ago. So digging in further, almost half a billion people use Facebook on their mobile devices every single month. So that's 488 million monthly users. And, and looking at some of the other numbers, and these are numbers that are sure to be thrown out there by Mark Zuckerberg in the road show starting next week, there are more than 125 billion friend connections on the social network, and Facebook users generated an average of 3.2 billion likes and comments per day in the first quarter. So the numbers of how many people use Facebook and how often they interact with the service, they're just mind-boggling, um, just looking at these, these billions numbers. So I want to dig in further here, looking at how many people work at Facebook. There are about 3,500 employees at Facebook right now, and that's up from just 2,400 a year ago. So Facebook really is ramping up hiring to be able to continue to run the service and, and evolve the service to keep up, keep up with all of those nearly 1 billion users. Um, and there is that quote from from the roadshow saying we do expect headcount growth to continue. Um, so moving along here to Facebook's revenue numbers, because of course we know it's very popular, but how are they um, creating revenue and profits from that profitability? In, the, in, in all of last year, Facebook had $3.7 billion in revenue. That was up 88% from the year before. But growth actually slowed from 2010 to 2011 from where it was from 2009 to 2010. So it's still significant, you know, 88%, but between 2009 and 2010, we saw 154% growth. So the rate of growth almost cut by half 
um, over the past two years. But you know, those still significant. So 3.7 billion is the revenue number, the big revenue number that's going to be thrown out there in terms of annual revenue last year. Now, looking at um, the first quarter, it looks again like revenue is slowing because revenue in the first quarter of this year compared to a year ago was only up 45%. I mean, it's still significant and shows that Facebook is on track to have you know, much greater revenue this year than last year, but that, that revenue growth is slowing. And that's something that Zuckerberg and COO Sheryl Sandberg are probably going to be pressed on in their roadshow. Now, looking at the profitability, this, of course, is, is the bottom line. This is what really matters um, in a lot of ways to investors is net income. Facebook had a billion dollars in net income in 2011 and 600 million in 2010 and 229 million in net income. So again, the net the growth the growth rate for net income is slowing, um, but the company does have significant margins. You know, to bring in one billion dollars in net income in 2011. Um, also, I want to show here one thing that could be concerning for investors. In the first quarter of this year, net income actually declined from the first quarter in 2011. We saw $205 million in net income in the first quarter of this year, down 12% from the prior year. And the reason for that is simply is that Facebook is spending more money on marketing, on research and development, and administrative costs. You know, they're hiring more people, having to deal with greater headcount. Um, so this is sort of part of the growing pains being a fast-growing startup, your costs are just going to go up. So net income did decline in the first quarter of this year, um, and we could see a lot of questions about what that's going to mean moving forward. Um, Facebook does have $3.9 billion in cash and cash equivalents on its balance sheet. That's how it can make acquisitions like its $1 billion acquisition of Instagram. Um, now, Facebook is primarily an advertising business. 85% of its revenue in 2011 came from advertising. It's bread and butter are those ads that you see on the side of your Facebook page. It's pretty straightforward where its, its, its revenue comes from. Now, the um, it it's actually has a smaller percentage of its, of its revenue in the first quarter of this year, just 82% coming from advertising instead of the 85%. So the company is trying to diversify away from its reliance on advertising. Now, when Facebook reaches out to advertisers and tries to get them to spend on its site, its main advantage is the fact that it can reach 900 million people around the world monthly. It also stresses what it calls relevance. It has all this information about what movies you like, uh, where you live, where you grew up, what your favorite TV shows are, what brands you like, and it targets people based on all of that information that you decide to share with Facebook. So all that information that you put on your Facebook page is valuable, um, not just for connecting with friends and, and finding people with common interests and, and people you went to high school with, but also for targeting advertising. And the key thing about advertising, I think even more valuable than the relevance, re relevance is what they call social context. Um, Facebook targets ads based including information about what your friends like or where they check in or what they're doing. So Facebook says that, it's in, that people are more likely to respond to ads if they know that their friends like that brand. So if you say you like Coke or you like Dark Knight, when Warner Brothers is advertising you their next movie, you know, the sequel to The Dark Knight, or when Coca-Cola is advertising to you, they could say, um, you should check out Coke here are 10 of your friends who like Coca-Cola. So they can highlight your friends' connections with a brand, which makes it a much more effective message. And so these are the three key things in, in Facebook's advertising pitch. Um, let me just move to the next slide here. So Facebook says that the overall global advertising market, with all types of advertising, television, uh, print, et cetera, that's a $600 billion market. And because Facebook is competing with many different types of advertising methods, traditional online advertising, display ads, mobile ads, offline ads, Facebook actually thinks that it can eat up a significant portion of that $600 billion because it's not just targeting one of those. Um, it's just sort of creating a new category of advertising that would um, compete with both traditional and digital advertising and could um, cannibalize a lot of those different types of advertising. The real thing about Facebook advertising, though, is that the growth potential is on mobile devices. It only started displaying ads to those nearly half a billion people who use Facebook on mobile devices. They only started displaying ads on them in March. So we really haven't seen any impact in the earnings from mobile advertising, and that's where 
all the experts who I've been talking to, that's where they expect the real um, revenue growth, and that's where the real potential is down the line. Now, the rest of Facebook's revenue that's not from advertising is from what they call payments. And if you're not familiar with this business, you just have to think about Zanga. Zanga doesn't charge to play their games, but they sell virtual goods, like a virtual cow for Farmville. If you buy virtual goods, you have to go through Facebook's credit system. So you give them your credit card, and you basically pay through Facebook. Facebook takes a 30% cut of all Zanga's game payments. So if you want to spend any money on Zanga games, you're going through Facebook, and Facebook takes 30%. The same is true with all other games on the Facebook platform. So um, it, this is key now for the, for the gaming business, and obviously there are a ton of, of games on Facebook from Playdom and Playfish and obviously Zanga, and whenever you buy any virtual goods, you're paying Facebook. The other thing is, is that this is now limited to games, but down the road, Facebook says it may seek to extend payments to other types of apps. That means entertainment apps. Right now you can go and watch a, a concert in real time that's being streamed over Facebook. You can watch movies like um, The Dark Knight, which I mentioned earlier. You can actually stream Dark Knight on Facebook. Facebook is going to end up taking a cut of that. And down the line, I actually predict that there could be retail happening on the Facebook platform. Your friend bought this dress. You, you might want to buy it too. Click here to purchase this dress directly on Facebook. Facebook would take a cut. So I think social retail could really big, be a big money maker for Facebook down the line. But right now, about 15% of Facebook's revenue comes from these payments, which are primarily from games on the platform. Now, um, the question is, how big is this virtual goods market, which is what the payments business is limited to now? Facebook points out that this could be a $15 billion market by 2014, uh, and, right, and it's already bigger than a, a $7 billion market. So the, the virtual goods business is already big, um, and down the line we could see Facebook expand beyond virtual goods. Um, Facebook's payments revenue grew 98% in the first quarter of this year to 872 million. And the reason why we saw such massive growth is because last July, Facebook started demanding that any game makers who ran on Facebook's platform do all of their sales through Facebook. So that explains why we saw that massive growth. Once we see um, Facebook sort of encourage other businesses get into this payments business, whether it's retail or more entertainment services, then we could see even more significant growth. But that explains that 98%. That's kind of a funny and potentially misleading number. Um, and I think this is a good time here to talk about Facebook's relationship with Zanga. It's impossible to talk about the payments business without talking about Zanga because Zanga is by far Facebook's biggest uh, customer in terms of a, a games maker. And Facebook is actually, I'm sorry, Zanga is actually um, you know, responsible for 12% of, of Facebook's revenue in 2011 and 11% in, in the first quarter of 2012. So these companies are very much interconnected and very reliant on each other. And it's that 11% of revenue in 2012, that's a combination of fees from Zanga and also advertising bought by Zanga. So it, this is a potential risk down the line if you think about the fact that Facebook relies on Zanga for 11% of its revenue. Um, but obviously these two companies are very interconnected. Um, now, Facebook warns in its risk factors about its relationship with Zanga, saying that if Zanga does not maintain its level of engagement with the users, or if, they're, if Facebook is unable to maintain its positive relationship with Zanga, the financial results could be harmed. So it's really worth noting how unusual it is to have such a big percentage of revenue from just one, um, one company. Now, there are a number of interesting risk factors here that I think investors need to really do their due diligence on. Because this is an unusual company, it's obviously a one-of-a-kind type company, and it has some interesting risk factors. If the, if the site can't keep its users engaged, then it, that's, that's certainly a bad thing for advertisers. If the site can't make its ads valuable to marketers, then those advertisers are going to stop spending on the site. So it really needs to keep you know, evolving and keep those users hooked. It needs to keep those 900 million people checking every single month. The other thing is that Facebook is really relying on the fact that it's going to be able to monetize all of its mobile usage. It only started really putting ads on mobile 
in March, and it's too soon to say how effective that's going to be. Facebook has to be really careful about not alienating all those mobile users and frustrating them by having too many ads on the mobile platform. So it's going to be interesting to see how they walk that line of making sure that they're making money off all these people who are using the mobile device, but without overwhelming them with ads and driving them away from the service. So those are some of the risk factors. But we're going to pull up some of the other risk factors here. There's a lot of talk about privacy in Facebook. People can be um, frustrated if they feel like Facebook is, is showing their information improperly. They get frustrated if it's too hard to manage the privacy uh, controls, of which Facebook has many. Facebook lists a number of risk factors related to privacy, saying that if they disclose users' information, that could really hurt Facebook's reputation. It would certainly drive business away. Facebook also points out that it is subject to laws and regulations regarding privacy, data protection, and other matters. So if those laws change, that could really change how Facebook can use that personal information in terms of targeting ads and how people perceive the site. Because if people don't feel safe and secure using Facebook, that could really hurt its popularity. Um, another interesting thing here, and which I think a lot of investors don't really realize, is that this is a company that's not only led by CEO Mark Zuckerberg, but is actually controlled by Zuckerberg. He controls a majority of voting stock. So he has, as the S1 document um, says, he has control over key de decision making. He has, you know, he has a board, obviously, but at the end of the day, he has the, the final say on decisions. And um, the risk factors include the fact that if Zuckerberg or COO Sheryl Sandberg were to leave, that could be majorly detrimental for the business, and investors need to be aware of that. Um, and the other thing that's worth pointing out is because this is a controlled company and Mark Zuckerberg does have voting control, NASDAQ rules do not require Facebook to have independent directors, a compensation company, or independent nominating function. So if you're concerned that this company does not have a diverse enough board, that's not something that shareholders will be able to have a say about because at the end of the day, its status as a controlled company means that Mark Zuckerberg does get to retain control. And then if you're, if you're interested in, in what um, Facebook's challenges are going to be down the line, Facebook points out that its risk factors include competition that could come from anywhere. Obviously, Google is working on Google+, Microsoft, even Twitter could be a challenge to Facebook. There have been some patent lawsuits that, that Facebook points out in its S1. There's the, the lawsuit with Yahoo. Um, concern about patent lawsuits is what drove Facebook to make its acquisition of patents um, that, that were originally AOL's patents that it purchased from Microsoft. And the other thing to keep in mind, Facebook is not going to be a dividend yielding stock. Um, Zuckerberg says they do not have any intention to pay dividends for the foreseeable future. Instead, they are going to be reinvesting that money into the company. Um, so I think that's about it for now. Those are some of the highlights. And we, we could get another S1 before uh, the company does go public. But in the meantime, these are the latest numbers and um, some very interesting statistics in there. So we, we welcome your questions. And Julia, we have some questions that we'll turn to uh, right now off the top. Thank you very much for that presentation uh, on taking us inside of Facebook. Uh, I learned a great deal about it. Uh, let, let me just hit one that I see right in front of me, Julia, which is, is Zynga 11% of total revenue or 11% of the payments portion of revenue? My understanding is that in 2011, Zenga's payments and its advertising, because Zenga does a lot of advertising to promote and cross these <coughs> games, the combination of those two things comprised 11% of Facebook's overall revenue. So 11% of the, think, go ahead. Overall, yeah. And I think that is a testament to how big um, a piece of all of the payments revenue Zanga is. Because if, if Facebook, and we don't know what the breakdown is between advertising and payments, but I would assume that the majority of that is payments. And um, if only 15% uh, of Zanga's overall revenue came from payments last year, uh, then a, a huge percentage of that is Zanga. Let's turn to the question of the what's and the when's to the extent that we know it. Do we know, for example, how many shares, what percent of the company, uh, how many shares, what percent of the company is going to be floated on the IPO date? And do we have estimates of what the price will be? 
Um, I believe that there are two and a half billion shares outstanding, um, or a little bit uh, below that. I'm not sure exactly what the float is going to be, and I actually can I can check on that. I just don't have that handy right now. And there's been a lot of different reports on what the price of the shares is going to be, but I believe the last we heard is that it was going to hold on. I think there was just a, a report on this. Um, the, there was a report out actually just maybe 20 minutes ago saying that the IPO price range was going to be in the high 20s to mid 30s and if Facebook price is at $35 a share which would be the upper end of that price range the valuation would be about $88 billion. $88 billion um, and, so and, and if, it dollars valuation. if it prices at, uh, at, that, at that price, let's say it prices at $35 a share uh, and the company made a billion. What would the in the most recent year? Uh, what would its PE be? Well, it's trailing PE, and I could just do a little division there. It would be. Um, let me just look at this here. So we have a ninety billion valuation. Uh, we could do the math. Ninety billion on a billion in profit. Yeah. So that would mean yeah. the the company would be valued at ninety to one. Yeah, so that would be that would be its trailing PE. Its trailing PE would be 90. The market's yes. trailing PE is what about 12, 15? Yes, I mean, and the reason why that it's it's so massive is because this is a company you're not buying for its trailing earnings. You're buying this company because you think it's going to continue to grow at a massive at a rapid pace. Um, do you think a question from uh, T. Lewin? How do you think the recent earnings announcement will affect the initial offering price? I think that um, the first quarter earnings showed that this is a company where growth is starting to slow a little bit as it invests in its future. And it, you know, there are costs associated with being a, a company with you know, 900 million users and 3,500 employees. And I think that there's just going to be a tiny bit more caution um, because I think no one likes to see slowing growth. I think the slowing growth makes a lot of sense. I don't think it's necessarily cause for any concern at all, but I do think that it is a little bit of a reality check that this, you know, Facebook could not keep on growing at the pace which it was growing at two years ago. That would have been impossible right. um, from a revenue growth standpoint. So um, I think there's just going to be a little bit more caution, and I think the fact that all of these IPOs, you know, like Zanga and Groupon and a lot of these other IPOs in the internet space have not been faring so well mm -hmm. has added another a note of caution into the market. I'm going to turn now to one of our audio questioners uh, and Chen Yu Lin, you're now recognized. Chen Yu Lin. Pose your question if you, uh, if you can through your microphone. Mr. Lin or Ms. Lin, we'll try and come back with you. We're going to meanwhile go to Kumar Samir for an audio question. Kumar? Well, evidently we're not having much luck here. Let's try Holly Pressman, uh, who has uh, her hand raised, her virtual hand raised. Holly, do you have an audio question? Hi. Uh, yes, I just was wondering if Facebook has addressed the possibility in their risk uh, segment of their presentation uh, for the possibility that users would navigate over time and segment to other social media platforms based on common interests. You know, Pinterest yes. is a good example. Yeah, they 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 definitely acknowledge that competition could come from anywhere, and um, obviously Facebook you know, has to make sure that people um, want to keep connecting sort of with their friends in this more generic um, social network rather than something that's much more focused on a certain niche or, um, or based about sharing. And I think that, I, I would say that Pinterest is not a social network. I think it is a sharing platform the same way that Tumblr is a sharing platform, which is much more about sharing from one to many and not as much about the interconnections that, in the same way that Facebook is. But Facebook does acknowledge that competition could come from anywhere. And um, it, it, you know, there, there are sort of limitless companies and companies that may not have even been founded yet that could pose a threat to Facebook's growth down the line. Thank you. Well, let me take uh, one more, uh, shall I take one more audio question for Moshanhan Koduri? Mr. Koduri, or Ms. Proceed, please. 
Mr. Kod Koduri. All right, let's go to A. Hudda, H-U-D-D-A. Hi, I have a quick question. Uh, so how, how do common investors like uh, like us get in on this uh, IPO? When Google came out with its IPO, it had uh, you know it had gone out to the masses, and uh, you know people got a chance if they wanted to get in on that IPO. Do you know what Facebook's strategy is? I think they're just doing it as a traditional IPO. So once it starts trading, you would be able to buy shares, but they're not doing anything unusual like a Dutch auction. It's just a traditional IPO. There was some talk about that, but it looks like they're just just going the traditional route. In in the Google case, as I recall, uh, Google took steps to uh, democratize, if you will, the um, the distribution of its initial public offering shares. One of the other questions that I see on the screen is a, a writer saying, I have an ING shareholder account, uh, but they're not part of the selected brokerage firms in the IPO, so far as this individual knows. I don't know the, the fact of that. Maybe, Julia, you do. Who, what brokerage firm should I be, contact, be in contact with to get in on the IPO before it hits the secondary market? My suspicion here is that uh, only the best clients uh, of the underwriting syndicate brokerages, uh, and that these could be uh, institutional clients, clients, family offices, individuals uh, who do a lot of business, would, would receive an allocation at the IPO price. It, it, am I understanding that correctly, Julia, to your understanding? I, I believe so. I believe so. I think that unlike Google, which went out of its way to allocate shares. I think this is just a traditional IPO. It's going to be very hard for anyone who's just a regular investor to get in at the IPO price. And the question is just that, you know, once it, once it starts trading on the open market, which we expect to be around May 18th, that's when anyone will be able to buy a share, purchase a share, just like, like any other stock. In the but secondary in the market. IPO, in, in the regular, on the, you know, regular stock market. Um, it's just, yeah, it, and, but I think in the, before it goes public, um, it's going to be very hard for anyone who's just a regular investor to, to get access to it. So shares. that answers Steve Chow's question, which is how does the average Joe get a piece of the IPO? The average Joe probably isn't going to get a piece of the IPO and is left then to buying the stock in the secondary market after the IPO uh, on either day one of trading or in subsequent days of trading, and of course our history uh, with IPOs, Julie, as we all know from covering them for so many years, is that that first day can be extraordinarily volatile, uh, and yes. and the first week can be extraordinarily volatile. And with Facebook, it may just be a volatile company. We don't know what's going to happen with the trading, but we have seen, and, and Tyler, I remember covering the LinkedIn IPO with you um, last year, we could see a, a massive spike in the price on the opening day. And so that, that I, I would be shocked if it were not an incredibly volatile first day of trading. Mm -hmm. Let's go to another audio question, and this one is from Andres Acero. Andres. Yeah, I just have a quick question about... Um, was there any mention on Instagram on the S1, or do you see any upside um, on the revenue um, coming from Instagram? And how does that affect the IPO overall? I think that um, there was some question of whether the SEC would step up its oversight because of the Instagram acquisition. Instagram is not a revenue-generating company right now, so I don't think there will be a uh, direct impact on revenue in the current quarter. I think that the reason why Facebook acquired Instagram is because it wants to be Facebook wants to be the way which people share photos. And people were starting to share a lot of photos on Instagram, and this ensured that it kept um, all of the traffic that was going to that popular site you know, within the Facebook family. And I think that Facebook is going to, you know, uses, Facebook makes money the more time people spend using the service, and the more people share photos, the more time they're spending using the service. So to draw a line between those things, I would say Facebook is doing this to ensure that it is the way that people connect and share information, and that will help it um, generate more profits down the line. You know, when you share photos, you may see an ad on the side. So that's sort of how they're going to start monetizing Instagram and bringing it under the umbrella of their uh, their photo sharing. Julia, do we know uh, what percentage of users, and then what percentage of revenues and profits are non-US? Um, I have to double check the 
the S1, but it is a significant portion, and I know that the non-U.S. portion is growing substantially. I believe it is over, well over half of revenues, or well over half of users. Will Facebook launch its own phone or pad device? Is that a, there, built into the pricing? There is a lot of talk about that, um, and I think what's most likely, and, and the rumor that's been out there is that Facebook is going to partner with as, with FT, uh, HTC, HTC, which is the phone maker, um, on a Facebook phone. Facebook has told me they are not interested in creating hardware. I don't think it's in Facebook's DNA to you know go out there and and buy a phone, but I think it is. It, it, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Facebook being heavily integrated into a phone from, say, HTC. But I don't think that that's going to be. Um, I, I think if they were to announce that they're actually creating a tablet device or creating a phone, that would definitely move the stock. But I, I would be surprised if we saw the company investing to create an original device. I, would, I, I expect the company to do more partnerships. Let's try another audio question and go back to Chen Yu Lin and see if the microphone is working this time. Chen Yu Lin, please. Thanks a lot. Um, I got uh, three questions. Can you validate the uh, speculation that Facebook will use Microsoft's Bing in a more aggressive manner to create this walled garden of social and search and thus pincing Google between Microsoft and Facebook? And secondly, do we have an idea of what the average user is spending on Facebook so that every time someone signs up you can say that person accounts for $12 this year. Thank you. Um, people, not that many people actually spend money on Facebook. The revenue that's coming from Zanga's games is from a relatively small percentage of Zanga users. So most people don't spend any money on Facebook. They're, they're valuable to Facebook because Facebook shows them ads. So they're not actually spending, I would say, their value comes from sort of being recipients of ads. Um, and as to the rumor that Facebook would align more closely with Microsoft, I think it's an interesting one. I think Microsoft has been invested in Facebook for a long time. But I think that Facebook um, would be unlikely to block Google entirely. I mean, Facebook and Google do have competing services, and then Google has Google+. Plus. But Facebook does see itself as a utility that um, works on multiple devices, multiple platforms. I don't see Facebook blocking out Google entirely. I just don't, I, I can't really imagine that happening. I, although I, I would expect Facebook to continue to you know, integrate Bing into its services, but not at the ex entire exclusion of Google. Let's go to another audio question from Keanu Dane. Keanu. I'm afraid we have a bad connection with uh, Keanu Dane. We'll maybe try again. Meantime, let's go to David Baker. David Baker, please. No, no question from David Baker there. Shall we go to Ryan Mallow? Ryan Mallow. Ryan Mallow, please. Um, Tyler, why don't I just jump in here with some sure. comment on um, average and the international growth? Now, even though the international um, is, uh, user base has been growing significantly, the company said that in 2011, 56% of revenue um, came from advertisers in the U.S., um, down from 62% in 2010. So international users are growing, but the international revenue has still not caught up. Um, with the domestic revenue just because, simply I would say because of the relationship with uh, advertisers in the U.S. So that is a growth area. Let's say, Julia, I want to buy shares of Facebook before the IPO. Can I do it and how? I think that's back to our, our old, uh, the, the, the conversation we just had about how hard it is to get shares of this company before the IPO. I think that's a, you know, going to your brokerage and seeing if they have the kinds of relationships and if you're the kind of customer to get access, but it's, it's certainly probably the hottest ticket uh, in, a, in a decade. But, so I can't buy it on any of those uh, secondary or pre-market markets? No, so this so Facebook used to trade on second second market, which mm -hmm. is a platform for trading shares of private companies. But at the end of March, they halted trades to prepare for the IPO. So, so that possibility was, is out of the question. 
that possibility is out. If you were an accredited investor, you could apl basically apply to purchase shares, and Facebook had the right to re reject any of those buyers, but they did allow a, a number of people to buy shares in the secondary market in order to basically allow ex-employees to cash out, because there was no other way to let them cash out. But those trades halted at the end of March. Let's talk a little bit about, about user growth rates. We have, as you said earlier, 900 million now. Uh, faster user growth outside of the U.S. than in the U.S. What has the trajectory of user growth been, uh, and, and where is it forecast to go? Um, the, the user growth rates have been have been uh, just remarkable if you just look at the percentage numbers. And I have to see if I can pull up the... Um pull up the slide again, but I believe that was our first slide there. Um, I think that at some point the growth rate has to slow because there are only so many people with mobile devices or with computers who can access Facebook. One real challenge to Facebook's growth is the fact that it is blocked in China. So um, that alone limits the number of people who can can use Facebook. So that, that slide that we have up now, that's the monthly active users. Um, oh, I, we just had that. It was 900 million uh, monthly active users. Um, so I think that there are only so many people in the world, and if you can't access China, that's going to that's gonna hinder Facebook's growth. Which brokerage is the lead underwriter? Um, I believe it is Morgan Stanley, but I can pull that up right now. That's my recollection as well. Yeah, it looked like Morgan Stanley, I believe. That there would be a, a, a it would be reasonable to assume that there would be a large syndicate here, and, and that all of the major players uh, in securities underwriting would be would have some role in this. There, um, there was a very large number. I yeah. believe it was thirty run thirty one mm -hmm. banks in total. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, do ETFs yeah, underwriters in total? Are, are ETFs going to own any Facebook eventually? And and. The, the index funds, the index followers, because they're not going to be in an index immediately, are they? No, but I believe that their um, decision to list on the NASDAQ was predicated on the assumption that they would be um, as part of the NASDAQ, listed as part of the NASDAQ 100. All right, let me go to another audio question from Brett Voagino. Brett? <laughs> Brett? Yes. Yes, please pose your question. Uh, it's it's up there. Where it's, where? I can't see. Oh, um, there it is. Is there any is chance, there any of, chance getting of getting a market order, a market filled, order filled through, through say Fidelity? fidelity? That is a question I can. Available to trade. Um, I do not know about getting a market order filled through Fidelity. I can't answer that question. We do expect the company to price on the seventeenth and start trading on the eighteenth. Although that is that could change at any at any point. All right. Thank you, uh, Julia, very, very much for all your insight and uh, the hard work that you put into this. I, I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. And, I, and Tyler, we will continue to be obviously covering this on CNBC and also on my blog, which is mediamoney.cnbc.com. So I encourage you all to check back in regularly because we will have um, a lot of updates. Oh, wait. You know, I'm just seeing some headlines now. Facebook said its IPO range of the high 20s to the 30s. So it is, um, it is what, we, what we just discussed. And, um, Keep, keep on checking back in on CNBC for the latest. The pricing range, high 20s to low 30s. Julia, one of the nicest people I know and certainly one of the smartest. Thanks very much. Now, to those oh, who thanks, are, Tyler. you bet, the, to those who are attending, uh, we will post this uh, on CNBC.com. And if you want copies of the presentation of the slides, we can send them via email to you. Did I get that right? We'll send a link to everyone so that you can you can pull up uh, some of the slides of the presentation matter that you want. So that concludes today's uh, seminar or webinar on Inside the Facebook Money Machine. Thank you all for attending.